Good morning. So uh, I wanted to welcome you all here at the ICTP for this uh, school on commutative, uh, on algebraic geometry and algebra in prime characteristic. So <clears throat> I hope you had a nice travel and uh, are now fresh and so on, so that you can follow the lectures. Uh, I uh, wanted to thank everybody who made this possible, so the organizers, uh, Professor Tung, Rossi, and Wermer, uh, and uh, obviously all the lecturers. Um, so <clears throat> I maybe can say a few word, words about ICTP, so I mean you uh, you know ICTP is a research center which also is devoted to uh, helping development of science in developing countries. And uh, so I can mention a few programs that you have that you might be interested in in the future. Uh, so one is the diploma program. So maybe you personally would not be interested, but you know your students who have uh, uh, their first degree could come here and uh, stay for a year and have some courses. <clears throat> and then this should enable them to do a PhD, uh, go to a PhD program afterwards. I see at least one uh, diploma student in the audience. So. <clears throat> uh, then we have uh, a show stage where you, uh, you, know, you can apply for this and then you stay associated to us for five years and you have several visits during this time. Uh, then we have visitors and postdocs positions know that uh, uh, I also see one of our previous postdocs, at least in, in the audience. Um, so you, you should look at our homepage and see uh, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, maybe apply for some of these if you're interested or encourage your students to apply. <coughs> so in some sense, uh, you know, this was already all I wanted to say. I mean, we're already a bit late. So um, I wish you a very successful stay and I hope that uh, you will learn a lot here and uh, uh, welcome again. Thank you. So, uh, if I remember when it is uh, the fourth or the fifth school on commutative algebra on this of this sky uh, held at uh, ICTP, and this time uh, it is organized by uh, uh, Professor Rossi from Genoa, Professor Verma from India, and Professor Chung from Hanoi. And uh, this morning we in have two sections. The first one was. Uh, are given by the uh, uh, two lecturers, Professor Brenner from Osnabrück and uh, Professor Keiichi Vantanabe from uh, <coughs> Japan. And then we will have a, a coffee break and followed by three uh, 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 um, presentations on the uh, research uh, region. So now I would like to invite Professor Brenner to give you the first lecture. That's the point. So I was sure in some sense I will make some jokes. So, and this, so now, better? Now, is it loud enough? Put this down there. So, um, maybe we don't need that upstairs. Can we get rid of that? 
Someone know? So you can uh, completely concentrate on the blackboard. And so the, the name of the school is, what was it? Commutative algebra and algebraic geometry in positive characteristic. And in my series, I would like to uh, demonstrate that the two things go hand in hand. And from the commutative side, I will talk about tight closure and what is uh, strongly connected Hilbert Kunz theory. And uh, today I will start with Hilbert Kunz theory. With tight closure, we go on tomorrow. And uh, on the algebraic geometry side, we will use mainly vector bundle techniques. And you know, so the main idea is to use uh, results from vector bundles on projective varieties to get some. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I've just put down the microphone. A little higher. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. If you prefer that, you can look upstairs. I don't mind. <laughs> so, what was my sentence? Yeah. So the idea is to use. Uh, so we, we we look at some problems um, originating in pos in uh, commutative algebra in positive characteristic. We translate it into the more uh, algebraic geometry side, in particular vector bundle uh, theory, and we solve some of the problems by using methods from, from this side. No? Um, okay. No? And so the positive characteristic is P. That's universally accepted that the prime characteristic is denoted by P. And what is also universally accepted is that p to the power e is usually denoted by q. So I write it right now because uh, sooner or later I, uh, I, I, will, I will use it anyway. No, and uh, say we have a ring and the of positive characteristics. So we have a field of characteristic p inside and there then we have the uh, Frobenius homomorphism, which sends an element f to each pth power. And uh, the first miracle is that this is a ring homomorphism. No, and of course, you can iterate it. And then the, the oh, so that's the Frobenius. And the eth Frobenius sends f to the power f q. No? And no commutative algebra in, in uh, positive characteristic deals with questions. Yeah, what, what can we do with these objects? What can we define? Uh, what kind of singularities occur when we look at uh, the action of the Frobenius? No, that's the main idea. Um, and so Kunz in uh, 69. He uh, looked, so in the situation I have written down there, he looked at the following function. Maybe I should write here. If we have an ideal inside our ring, no, then we can look at the um, ring generated by the, by the image, or maybe something like that, and that is denoted by i to the power bracket. Q. Oh, that's also standard notation. Oh, and how these uh, guys um, behave, in particular, how they behave asymptotically as, as uh, Q uh, is getting large. This is uh, one of the central topics in, in Hilbert Kunz uh, theory. So we have uh, two definitions. So The ring is fixed. We have an ideal, and uh, say the dimension. Yeah, let's say 
Oh, let's do it like that. So I suppose that I is primary to a maximal ideal m of height e, no, and the main important, there are two important cases that we have a local ring, then we don't have to think about the maximal ideal because there is just one and I will be primary to that maximal ideal and uh, the height of d is the dimension of the ring or we look at a graded or standard graded ring and then the maximal ideal will be the, then everything will be graded and the maximal ideal will be the, the irrelevant ideal. Okay. And uh, now then we can look at these powers and the corresponding residue class rings and because of this primary condition they have finite length. No? And, uh, and of course it would not be good to, to directly look at the length, we have to normalize it uh, by dividing by um, yeah, q to the height d. No, and then we consider this as a function in E. Well, you could also consider it as a function in Q. No? So this uh, mapping is a mapping from the natural numbers to, uh, no, to rational numbers. No, length is a natural number divided by a power of, uh, of the prime is, um, is rational numbers. So this is called the Hilbert-Kunz function. Oh, and usually you, you say here something like, oh, this is a mysterious function and a very interesting function. And uh, no. oh, it has uh, some surprising behavior. And then um, if, if something has a surprising or mysterious behavior, uh, nevertheless, you would like to understand, some, um, to understand it and to see some structure uh, in it. No? And maybe we call that phi i of e, something like that. Ah, I have, ah, ah okay. No, and uh, now if we, if we have this function, we define the Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity, multiplicity, something like that, um, just by, by looking at the limit. Huh? So we look at the, limit as e goes to infinity of the expression I have just written down. Oh, and hope that it exists. Yeah. And uh, in fact, Kunz in 76, he gave an example that this limit does not exist. And then Monsky, seven years later, proved that the limit always exists. And Monsky was right. So, I mean, Kunz lost interest because he found uh, this counterexample. <laughs> uh, but then Monsky showed that no? uh, uh, this limit exists not as a positive real number and the, and the natural uh, question he asked uh, whether this is a rational number. No, and uh, today I will talk about some positive results. In, in fact, in, in higher dimension it will not be always positive, but uh, today I will talk about positive results. Um, let me mention another important uh, property uh, of the Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity with that you can see that uh, um, it has something to do with um, singularity. So I should say, so we denote this then like that. No, the, the, multiplicity, Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity of the ideal. And for a local ring, 
Now, if we just talk about the local ring and we don't fix an ideal, we always mean the, the maximal ideal. And therefore, then, the hilbert kunz multiplicity of the maximal ideal we denote by the hilbert kunz multiplicity of the ring itself. No? Because literally taken, this does not make sense. No? So here we mean the maximal ideal. And um, yeah, the result I want to mention is due to uh, Watanabe, who will also give lectures here, and Yoshida from 2000 something, 2000, no, no. maybe, but I don't know exactly. And uh, now it basically says you have an unmixed uh, condition. I don't write it all down, but basically it says that the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity is always at least one, and it is one exactly if and only if R is a regular local ring. So you look here at, at unmixed local rings, the theory, and, and then you have this characterization. Now, so you see this is a nice uh, characterization of the, of the regular case. And so as soon as you have a singularity in your ring, you will have uh, you know, the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity will be strictly larger than one, and uh, no, that, so that gives you a, a measure for a singularity. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, now I'm I'm gonna explain how this uh, is related to. Um, vector bundles or this is the, no. I think we have we have nobody from category here so I, I just write equals locally free sheaves and um, If we go back to school for a second, in linear algebra, we consider equations, maybe let's say one equation in n variables, and we are interested here in the homogeneous case. No? And then there are, and the fi's are numbers inside a field. Well, and there are two very different behaviors. Either all fi's are zero, then the complete kn is the solution set. So that's the trivial case. So suppose further that not all of them is uh, zero, and say, then let's fix uh, one, say f1 is not zero. No, then the solution set we can write um, T1 as, now you have to subtract and divide by F1. No? And then you have uh, N minus 1, three variables, and the solution space is a vector space of dimension N minus 1. No? Now let's go one step further. Now let's consider that X is a... X can be anything, uh, topological space, or manifold, or scheme, or uh, the spectrum of a ring. And now we consider the case where fi are functions, and say differential functions, or continuous function, or in the algebraic setting, algebraic functions. Um, oh, here's some space object. And then we can do the, the same thing out of that we can um, construct um, a bundle above x by just looking at, you no, know, we have, a, well, let's denote it, v consists of a base point, and uh, you know, we can plug in the point into our functions, and uh, you know, then we get this equation we had before, no, I should write it like, well, like that. V is P, 
and in the second component we have the n variables, and this is the equation. And not so by because we have understood that if at least one of the functions does not vanish at the point p, then we can uh, use this construction, and then we see that the fiber, so let's say x is here the base space, and we have fixed the point p, and in the point p not all vanish, and then uh, the, the, the fiber of this thing, so this lives over x, uh, is uh, n minus one dimensional vector space. Hmm? I don't know. Hmm? But of course, if all the f1 up to fn vanish at that point, then suddenly this, uh, the vector space, the fiber, explodes to a n-dimensional vector space. And that we don't like. So, but easily we can get rid of, we only consider it here. So let u be the union of, of this set inside x and uh, dfi is given by the property that fi does not vanish at the point b. No, and then we can consider our guy above u, and uh, so this is a, a basic model for a vector bundle. No, and you see, uh, if we look at what happens over df1, say we can make the same trick here. And then this um, equation provides a trivialization. No, so this guy, so I, I call that already a vector bundle. And uh, we have on dfy, we have uh, trivializations, which, which are written down here. No? And uh, well. And, 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 and if, you, if you look at the situation in dfi intersected with dfj, you also see by this construction that the uh, change of the transformation mapping is a linear mapping. No? So that's part of the definition. Um, okay, so how, what has, does that have to do with this situation? Now we fix generators of our ideal, which is uh, m primary as before, and uh, no, so fi are elements inside the, the ring, but no, if you, if you know that's the idea of the spectrum of a ring in some sense, so that is not true uh, literally, but in some sense uh, it's uh, the, 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 the the elements of the rings are functions on the spectrum, but no, here, what is here is, is not. You cannot write just the field here. It's a bit more complicated. No, but the general idea that you can consider this equation uh, prevails here. No? So let's call, again, the spectrum of the ring x. And again, well, I don't have to write it down again. We take this notation and now dfi, this has to inter interpret it. No, the spectrum is the set of all prime ideals. This is the dfi is the set of all prime ideals where uh, fi does not belong to the prime ideal or is not zero in the residue class field. Okay, so we look at these... Uh, Maps, uh, these elements define a map from Rn to R. No, this is basically the same uh, thing here. No, so you go Fi, Ti. So Ti are now um, ah, elements here. And you look at the kernel. No, and the kernel in commutative algebra is usually denoted by the CCGs for the elements. No, and of course, um, no, so, so this by definition, everything what goes here to zero. But no, this map is in general not subjective because the ideals are primary. Uh, the, the ideal is primary to a maximal ideal, but it's not the unit ideal. No, it would be subjective only. Uh, if it is um, if it is if, if, if it is the unit ideal, no. But we have this exact 
sequence. And uh, if you write it down like here, uh, this is in general not locally free, this is locally free, this is in general, this module is in general not locally free. Because uh, now you have this gen degenerate behavior that where the dimension of the firewall goes up. And that is, uh, that we don't like. So instead, we restrict the sequence of uh, modules. Uh, we look at the corresponding sheaves on our open set U. And then, no, I mean, you can always now write a tilde above everything. I will not do it. Uh, so we have that thing, we have O, U, N, the, the nth uh, direct sum of the structure sheaf. And because I is, uh, no, I mean, locally on U, I always contains a unit. So therefore, I can write here O, U, and this is subjective. But subjective now means here as a sheaf homomorphism. So this is uh, exact sequence of locally free sheaves. And I prefer uh, to work um, with uh, locally free sheaves instead of uh, modules. Now, so for example, one advantage you have here, um, if you apply the Frobenius to this situation, now Frobenius is um, not exact. Now pullback by Frobenius is in general not exact. So you get some non-exactness and everything gets complicated. But Frobenius on, if you apply the Frobenius on an exact sequence of locally free sheaves, then the pullback is exact again. And you don't have to worry about uh, non-exactness. Now, so this is um, oh, important uh, step. Now, it's... Uh, Locally free sheaves on U, on this open subset of uh, X. And in fact, you have on each DFI, you have trivializations for that. So, so uh, here, of course, I have the nth power. This is easy, this is easy. This is more complicated, but it's given as the kernel bundle, kernel sheaf of this subjective sheaf homomorphism. Okay. Mm. Okay, so I will not give an exact definition. So in fact, I have wrote some notes, and um, so I have uh, checked whether you can find the notes. And so the notes is, is the name of the, of the course, Vector Bundles and Tight Closure, and I tried it with Google. With Google, you don't find it. Then I tried it with DuckDuckGo. And with DuckDuckGo, you find it. At least I found it with DuckDuckGo. So much better than Google. Forget about Google. But don't, don't try right now. You should concentrate here, what, what I am doing here. Um, OK. This makes life easier, but it's still complicated. Um, so now we look at the graded case. So graded case means we have a standard graded ring, and the ideal is uh, homogeneous, and all the, the, the generators are homogeneous, and uh, of course it's primary to the irrelevant ideal. So the degree of Fi is Di, and then our um, sequence, now I can write down the same sequence, which is now graded, and therefore, so here we have U is the uh, I is D of the irrelevant ideal, and this is just the spectrum of R without the irrelevant ideal. No, so really, 
Now here you might have the point, uh, the, the idea that, oh, oh well, what, what does it help if I go to a, to a smaller subset? I will lose uh, information somehow. But here you only go to the punctured spectrum. No, this is called the punctured spectrum. So you just remove one point in order to get the locally free situation. Punctured spectrum. And because we are graded, we can look at the projective variety. And uh, no, I mean, the cone map is defined anyway only outside this point. So uh, what happens on the projective variety reflects anyway what happens on the punctured spectrum, not what uh, happens on the, on the spectrum itself. And so on this guy, we have uh, basically the same sequence, but now we have to allow shifts no, in order to have the complete information. No, I mean, here we have now a graded situation, but in the graded situation we have shifts, and if we go to the projective variety, uh, this has the effect that we have here uh, some m, no, and here, what was the OU before becomes now O Y M minus D I. I goes from one to N and here again we have the also denoted by just the CCGs. But now we, first, we, we allow here a twist. No, and now, so here we don't have a free object anymore but they are still locally free. Yeah? Say it again. I, I, I didn't get it. It's a standard graded, standard graded. A zero is the field, yes. A standard, yeah, standard graded, yeah. And uh, before I forget it later, uh, so R will be normal and the dimension will be at least two. No dimension, zero and one is, is trivial, more or less. Now, so we have this sequence on the, on the, on Y, and uh, we will work with that sequence. But first we have to uh, relate this with the, with the, what is the time? Um, and, uh, and, and we are over um, an algebraically closed field and of course that is true in every, every characteristic but later on we will work in positive characteristic. No? Okay, so no, and um, So what are we interested? So here, we still has, have uh, this guy. And um, so this is basically in, uh, if in, in this situation, if we, are work, if, if we are a finite type over an algebraically closed field, this is, you can forget about the length. So this is just uh, this guy, the dimension of this residue class. Um, ring, and um, what I just said, if we apply the Frobenius pullback, so now I mean the absolute Frobenius on Y, we can pull back everything, and um, maybe I get rid of the M here for a second, I pull back and then I plug in M again. It's a little bit different, different, no? And uh, no, the nice thing, that is because of the exactness of the Frobenius on locally free sheaves, the, the Frobenius pullback of the syzygies is just the syzygies of the uh, p to the eth power of the elements. No? So we, we get the, this sequence to the qth power and the, no, here we have, it's just multiplied by Q 
and uh, no, here we have O Y anyway. No, and then because, but we are also interested to uh, have some color. There's a little bit of color. Now we plug in. Now we can have to look also at all the M twists. No, here gets an M, and here we just write the M. Here. Uh, no. And uh, our dimension, we want to compute uh, here. This is now uh, the co-kernel uh, of, of this map. And because we have exactness, we have the following uh, formula that the dim k dimension of R modulo i to the power q. No, it's a great situation. We um, look at the nth uh, degree component. And that we can compute, compute by evaluating uh, by globally evaluating these guys and taking the alternating sum. Now, and because of this normal and uh, dimension assumption, if we um, evaluate this, we get the dimension of the degree m component of the, of the ring. No? So this is H0OYM minus sum. So I don't, yeah, that's enough. H0 of OYM minus Q times DI plus uh, no, H0 of the syzygies on the projective spectrum in the nth twist. No, and uh, so this thing is just the the, the k dimension of Rm. So this is easy to compute. This is easy to compute, at least asymptotically. Now, you might have in small, so if, if this twist is close to zero, you might have some, uh, some difficulties depending on the genus. But if this number is large enough, and asymptotically you only have to look at when this is large enough, then um, then this is also easy to compute. So, so say this easy to compute, this easy to com compute, this is difficult co to compute, it's the Hilbert-Kunz function, uh, but then basically we have to look at this guy. Now the question is, did we win a anything? So, so we, we, we won several things. So if we denote this guy by S, no, so now we can say, okay, now we have any locally free sheath on a projective variety. Um, can we, what can we say about the Frobenius pullback of S um, in twist M and uh, depending on uh, Q and M. No? So this um, one should consider as a kind of a Frobenius Riemann-Roch problem. No, Riemann-Roch problem is basically, yeah, uh, yeah, say something about how global sections of uh, vector bundles behave. And uh, now here we have also the the the, the Frobenius um, action to understand here somehow. What? S, S is, is basically any locally free sheaf. But in F, F is the Frobenius pullback. H0. Ah, H0. This is the, you evaluate the sheaf. And this has a, a k dimension. And this is because we are on a projective variety, this has finite dimension. And this is the, the, no, the H0 bit. Hmm? Because gamma is also a, a, a capital H0. No, this is, uh, well, yeah, that's, that, that's this thing. Now, so we are talking about the global sections of, of vector bundles and their asymptotic behavior as uh, Q and M uh, varies. So what 
do we gain by that? Um, no, we can work over, so one thing I said already, we work with locally free sheaves, in particular uh, taking um, Frobenius is exact. We can, now we can use all the machinery of algebraic geometry, like intersection theory, ampleness, um, cohomology, Riemann-Roch theorems, Zero duality, not everything which, which is, uh, was de developed uh, there. No? And, but still, this is in general a very difficult question. So for the rest of my talk today, so I guess everything goes a little bit uh, in the direction of evening today. So I started, I think, 18 past, around, and I do not want to skip too many things. No, so this is now our new situation. And uh, so now, from now on, so we still uh, keep the graded assumption, so R is two-dimensional. And normal as before, everything as before. So Y is approach of R, so this is now a smooth projective curve over an algebraically closed field. So a, compared with other stuff, an uh, easy object. No, and ah, just to have an example in mind, uh, you can think of, uh, ah, for example, uh, Fermat curves are always good to consider in this uh, situation. Uh, so we have a plane, plane curve over our field. Uh, think of such a curve. Uh, that's our curve, and uh, no, our Vector bundles, no, somehow they, they, they look like that. My colleague, Moti Katzmann in, in Sheffield, uh, said always that I'm, I'm only able to draw one picture. It always looks like that. And then he, he did the same picture and made fun out of me. But um, So what makes life easier in the curve case? So the main point is we only have the zeros and the first cohomology. And they are related by their duality. Now starting with, if we have dimension three, then we would have here a surface. And on the surface, we have H0, H1, H2. H0 and H2 are related by, by uh, their duality. But uh, H1 can be anything in between. Uh, and it's difficult uh, to control it. No, and uh, then we have the notion of the, in higher dimensions, we, the degree of a vector bundle. Uh, you need a polarization that we don't need here. So what is the degree of a locally free sheaf, say of rank R? So there are two important invariants of a locally free sheaf. Uh, the rank, which is trivial, huh? so the rank here is just uh, n minus 1. No, the rank is additive. Here rank n, here rank 1, you subtract. No, this is the dimension of the fiber, as in the linear algebra example from the beginning. And uh, Frobenius taking pullback, uh, the rank doesn't change. Um, and the degree, no, you, if, if r is the rank, you look at the determinant bundle. And this is now an invertible sheaf. And invertible sheaves correspond to devices, veil devices, and they have a, a degree. No, so basically, um, yeah, maybe I don't draw a picture for, 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 for that thing. No? Oh, maybe I do. No, so, so here you have an invertible thing, so it looks just like that. No, here I have drawn something of rank two. No, the fibers should, should, should look like a plane. 
And now if you have here any section, a rational section, so it must not, no, it might, might have poles somehow like that. No, then you just count the zeros and the number of zeros counted correctly with multiplicities is the degree. And this number is always the same. Same is independent of the, of the chosen section. No? Okay, that's the degree, and the degree is also additive, so therefore we can, you know, the degree here is easy to compute, and uh, so that gives the degree here. And um, with the notion of the degree and the rank, we can denote, uh, we can define the Mumford semi-stability, and uh, now these notions are now always defined for all locally free sheaves, but of course in, in, the, center, in the center we have uh, sheaves which come as CCG sheaves from, from an ideal. No? So S is called semi-stable if for all sub-bundles, sub-sheaves, um, we have the, you know, we, now we look at the strange combination, we divide the degree by the rank, and this has always to be smaller or equal the corresponding expression. This is also called the slope of the bundle. Now, so we have this um, condition for all sub-bundles. Now, it's so uh, Mumford developed this notion in order to construct moduli spaces. Now the goal is to, to, to uh, smash all vector bundles of given rank and degree into one variety, as point in one variety. No? And that is not possible for all bundles, but the semi-stable notion occurs uh, naturally when you try to build moduli spaces. No? So, um, Looks strange at the first, uh, at first sight, maybe. And um, in positive characteristic, we call S strongly semi-stable. No, in positive characteristic, uh, you immediately have the question, if S is semi-stable, what about the Frobenius pullback of it? Is it still semi-stable? And the answer is no, in general, not. No? So. Strongly semi-stable means all Frobenius pullbacks are semi-stable. And uh, for all E. Huh? And, uh, yeah. So, now what is, uh, let's give one at least write it down, one example. So, as I said, one of the main examples is the ideal, uh, or is, is the ir irrelevant ideal, and say if we are in a, in a hyper, in, in a plane, plane curve, so a two-dimensional ring, three variables, one equation, now then the maximal ideal looks just like that. And then um, the CCGs, no, so then uh, the approach of R is a, no, like, like here, approach of R is a plane, a plane curve in P2. And the, the CCGs, they, ex no, so, so by definition, it's, it's a locally free sheaf on the, the approach, but this is, um, you can, it's the same as you look at the cotangent bundle of projective plane and you restrict to this curve. So let's call this curve C. Now, so a very natural um, object. No, if you, so projective, uh, projective space, they have tangent bundle, uh, cotangent bundle, and you look, well, no, you, you just restrict it to, to closed sub schemes no, and uh, very natural. Objects no? and uh, how this behaves the global sections under Frobenius is already the the question for 
Hilbert Kunz uh, multiplicity of the ring. Oh, so even in that case, it's, it's a really very natural object, I would say. Okay, so what we need is, no, you cannot, uh, so the easiest, if everything would be strongly semi-stable, then it would be much easier. That is not the case, but um, we have a filtration. So we have a filtration S1 in S2 in, no, I don't know, ST. Maybe ST is the last one. We have a filtration of uh, bundles, and the property S is that SI modulo SI minus 1 is always semi-stable. So this is called the hardener simran filtration. Long word I don't write down. So hardener simran filtration. Now, and the slopes, this is the slopes, they are decreasing. No? So the, the slope of S1 modulo 0 is, is the largest one, then S2 modulo S1 and so on, and they are all uh, semi-stable. No? So semi-stable of decreasing slopes. So this is the slope. Um, okay. And uh, that's still not good enough because uh, we need something with strong. No, and if we start, even if we start with a semi stable thing, no, if you have a semi stable thing, the Harden or Simran filtration will just be the object it itself. No, but now we apply the Frobenius, semi stability is destroyed. Then we apply the, the Frobenius again, and uh, it's more and more destroyed. However, um, there is a very important theorem of Langer in this case, which says, which is also true in higher dimension, it says that there exists an E such that um, the Hardener, let me let's formulate it like that, such that the Hardener Simon filtration of the pullback is stable. And that means all the, so you look at the hardener simon filtration of this pullback, and then all these quotients are strongly semi-stable. No, and that then means that if you go higher and higher, you just have to pull back everything and nothing else uh, is changing. No, you have a stable behavior. So maybe up to E, you have a chaotic behavior, but after E, uh, you just pull back the hardener or similar filtration again and again to get the new hardener or similar filtration. No? Um, okay. And... Uh, I wanted to give here one example. So, if we look at the Fermat uh, quartic, then this guy uh, in, in uh, characteristic three, that's the easiest example. Um, this guy is semi stable, but if we pull it back, with characteristic three, no, then we have to write here always a three. It's not semi-stable. No? So this gives the example of a semi-stable bundle, but uh, not strongly semi-stable. No, and the point is you can use, you can uh, use the, the curve equation directly to, uh, to get a section in the fourth twist of this thing. And now if you count the degree, so I uh, know you can count the degree of the syzygies, here you have to count 2 times 4 minus 3 minus 3 minus 3, which gives minus 1. So this has negative degree, but it has a global section coming from here. And uh, semi-stable bundle of negative degree cannot have global sections. No. So. No, this is uh, 
I would guess the easiest example, but there are many, many examples of, of, of that type. And um, yeah, that's, that's one of the main important uh, properties of semi-stable bundles that if they have negative degrees, then there are no global sections. No? And we want to understand this guy. And if we also have semi-stable, we can say in which degree this will be zero. And then by, by said duality, everything will be there up to the shift coming from a canonical shift. Yes? That you have, um, if you go to higher powers, so you have, so suppose E is zero. Then you have already, so suppose this is a stable, a stable Hardener similar filtration. If you go back to, uh, yeah, to the first guy, now you would always have this guy as I. And uh, the statement is that stable means that this, uh, these quotients, so Frobenius pullback of that, modulo Frobenius pullback of that is again semi-stable. And that holds then for all of them. No? So you cannot, no, stable in the sense that you always have to Frobenius pull back it. But then no further complication. No. And the point is that there exists an E, you have to go to a very high E, but then it will be stable, and then everything is just a repetition of what you have found here. Okay, and with that, well, I can come to... Yeah, I can... I can I think I can come to the end now. So, so I should say that uh, this, this uh, method of, uh, of um, understanding Hilbert Kunz theory in terms of vector bundle was developed uh, by uh, Trivedi and myself independently. Trivedi is also here, so she can. <laughs> she can tell everything what I do wrong here. And uh, so now let's go back to our situation. We have dimension two, normal, standard graded. We have uh, homogeneous elements of degree di. And uh, then we look at the so theorem myself and Trividi. Um, yeah, so how do I formulate it? So S are the CCGs, and uh, because of, of Langer, we know that some Frobenius pullback will, be, have, will have a stable Hardener or similar filtration. And let's uh, write this down. So so E is now the, this fixed number. Of course, you could take a higher number. F E of S has wrong harder narrow similar filtration. And then you have these objects, and they have slopes. And these slopes uh, we denote by slopes uh, mu k. And uh, then if we have these uh, slopes, we define a new k. Now you have uh, somehow to get rid of the e, so you have to divide by e again. And uh, so this is mu k. But think of it, just, we just have to know the numbers coming from the strong Hardener or similar filtration. That's the main idea. So minus mu k divided by p to the power e and the degree of the curve. No, and then the statement is that the Hilbert-Kunz multiplicity of e is um, degree of the curve divided by 2. And then we have, uh, ah, and the rank, the rank of these quotients, uh, of these quotients are rk. No, and then we have uh, the sum rk times mu k squared 
no, k comes, goes from 1 to t minus the square of the degree of the generators. No? So here we have a nice formula for the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity. And of course, the, what you see immediately, if you look at this side, everything are rational numbers. So from that theorem, if you want to say it's a corollary, the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of the ideal in this dimension 2 setting is uh, a rational number. No, so this is a positive answer to the question of, of Monsky in this uh, case. Okay, thank you very much. Mu k is the slope of this quotient in the strong Hardin and Simmons equation. Of, of this quotient. Uh, yeah, you, you, you use all the mu k's. All, you have the strong Hardin and Simmons equation, therefore you have these quotients, and each of them have, have, a, have a slope. And here you sum it, uh, well, in this version, and the square of them multiplied by the rank of, of this guy. No, so all the information is in the degree and the rank of, of, of these guys. <laughs>